Indian versus a fake Indian, and we can really focus on winning the future for Americans, and that's why I'm running. Okay, wait. I'm gonna uh, give me one second here. Uh, yeah. Our our viewers are saying our viewers are saying we have a tech problem that will very very quickly be fixed. Okay. Um, We're trying. I think it's sound. Let's see. Maybe not. So the, okay, tell you what we're gonna resolve this. We're gonna resolve this and go back to the intro. One second, guys. Okay. <laughs> they, can they? Can they? You know this. This is part of. I will say it is very funny to have to have a very tech savvy uh, Indian on the line with us. <laughs> um, <laughs> okay, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> so okay wait let's see here so we have uh there we go is is this better um folks are we good we're totally good i'm good here yes okay people are saying audio good now yes yes okay wonderful see that's maybe i just called you up for <laughs> to troubleshoot these issues um, okay, so, you know, there, there has been, there has been a lot of controversy. I mean, it's primarily, I've noticed from, from the left, which, which I found interesting about, uh, your, your claims. The audio better be working, by the way. So, okay, good. Everybody's saying it's still working. Um, behind your claims that you invented email and it, uh, humorously enough, it sort of lightens back to, Al Gore saying, oh, well, I invented the internet. And uh, so, I, I don't know, can you, without, without uh, going into too much detail, can you explain to, uh, to everybody just your, your role in that, and hopefully uh, you can explain it in a, in a way that discounts this sort of uh, likening to Al Gore? Yeah, first of all, Al Gore couldn't invent anything. The only guy, the thing the guy could invent is climate change. <laughs> and dollars out of that, you know. So that's what Al Gore could do. But let's get back to what I did do. And the fact is, I never made a penny off inventing email. It's an important point. So I don't have a horse in this race to make money or popularity out of Lucian. So let me tell you sort of the background. And I think it's a good way to start because you know the invention of email, Lucian, is fundamentally an American story, and it's a story that the liberal elites do not like because they want to keep people like myself of my background as good Indians. You know, they want us to be, uh, as Malcolm X would say, you know, a guy that I do like on certain levels, a good house slave, okay? They don't want me to be a field slave, and I'll talk about what I mean by that. You see, my parents came from India, the caste system of India, where your um, future was designated by where, where you grew up, right? What family you grew up in, mm -hmm. and not what you did. And the fact is my parents were people of incredible talent the fact that they made it out of india was like one in shiva I, i'm i'm so sorry uh they're saying that your volume is low is that better that's um no wait hold on let's get this right let's yeah let's see because uh, you know these these folks need to be able to to hear you as well as possible yeah uh i don't know where we go here for ball which is mm -hmm. Hold on, I'm going to raise it if there's any issues with the mic. We have it pretty far up. Is that better? Um, Can you guys? Is that is that better, folks? Test, test, test. Can you guys hear me? They're saying it's good. They're, yeah. Uh, is it good? Let me. I can move the mic up right up here. Yeah, I think. Okay, perfect. Yeah, no, they're saying they can hear you better now. Perfect. Who thinks there's some trolls doing it? <laughs> <laughs> okay, you know so uh, so e e email. We're still on email here. Yeah. So so anyway, so so the, so the reality is, you know, I came here as a seven-year-old kid when my parents came here with a with really a, a deep inspiration for this country. And by the time, and I was very motivated, Lucian. I wasn't just a nerd. By the way, I played baseball, playing sports, etc. But by the time I was fourteen, went through the public school systems in New Jersey, and I finished calculus as a 14-year-old kid. And I only had a few humanities courses left going into high school, and uh, I was my parents were concerned I was gonna drop out. The net of it was I got very lucky, and I got 
um, I got a uh, incredible opportunity to go to New York University. Forty students were selected into a special computer science program, and uh, in that computer science program, forty students uh, in uh, NYU had the opportunity to learn computer science. And I was one of those 40 students. I learned seven programming languages, including digital engineering. As a 14-year-old kid in a military-like intensive program, I'd leave at 6 a.m. in the morning from Newark uh, and travel into New York. This is as a 14-year-old, and most parents today are afraid to send kids down the street. And I finished top of the class there. When I finished that summer, um, uh, I came back. And my mom was working the heart of Newark, New Jersey. Most people still today are afraid to go to Newark. But in Newark, what is now known as Rutgers Medical School, was a uh, professor, uh, in fact, a high energy uh, experimental physicist who's still alive by the name of Dr. Les Michelson. And Dr. Michelson said, Shiva, don't drop out of high school. I'll give you a challenge. Mm -hmm. And so my high school teachers changed the rules solution so this 14 year old kid could now travel into Newark in the middle of class and work full time. So I had a full time job while I was finishing up high school. And the challenge I was given, Lucian, and many people over the age of 40 will know this, some of people over the age, under the age of 40 will know that there were two ways organizations communicated in the mid 70s or before. One was a telephone, landline telephone, there was no you know, mobile phones. And the other was what was called the inter office mail system. Okay, this inter office mail system was all based on paper. In, in this campus, there were three camp, campus locations. Every uh, office had a secretary, always a woman. You know, in those days, women essentially had four jobs, right? Teacher, secretary, housewife, uh, or nurse. And every office had a... Well, you know, I, I am very happy that computers have uh, finally replaced women, uh, just in America. Well, yeah, well, in some way, yeah. In some way, they made us all secretaries, okay? <laughs> uh, but what happened was, those women had on their desktop, which is a physical desktop, an inbox, an outbox, they had folders, file folders, they had what was called a Rolodex or an address book, they had paper clips, they had a thing called a typewriter, which I've used. You used to put a paper in, you used to put carbon paper, and you'd write a carbon copy. The memo was a very particular structure to, from, subject, CC, BCC, attachments. This was a complex system. This wasn't just. So tell me what, tell you what, because I. I, I as much as I love how technical you get about this, and I, I will say it to, uh, to our current viewers, I asked you this question earlier, and you actually, Shiva, you walked me through one of the most in-depth presentations I've seen in my life. Um, and I, I, I personally, after sitting through that presentation, have very little doubt that you were, uh, that, uh, yeah, that, that you invented the system. So you, you pulled the formatting, you pulled a lot of these ideas from a pre-existing paper system, right? And you essentially, you, you turned it digital. Um, and before, so what, one, of the, one of the arguments against you, these people are saying, oh, he's, he's claiming he's, uh, he invented email, he didn't really invent email, there was already messaging. You've never uh, um, sort of professed to be the inventor of digital messaging, right? Or any of these mechanisms of just people uh, texting or communicating through the internet, through uh, pre-existing computer infrastructure, right? Yeah, let, let's just first of all make this big distinction. The ARPANET guys, uh, these guys are the ones who are putting fake news that they invented, in fact, the internet. The right. protocols for messaging actually existed way back in the 50s by Western Union. So they've contemplated what they've done. To put it simply, you know, I converted the inner office mail system into the electronic version forwarding, BCC, registered mail, all those features, the key word here, Lucian, is the word system. We're not talking about simple exchange of text messages. The person who really should be credited for that is, if anything, Samuel Morse. So you, so, you <coughs> yeah, exactly. I mean, that, that is the other, the other joke. Before even any of these communications, if you're really talking about electronic mail or electronic communications, then you have to go all the way back to Morse code. And yeah. uh, what's the thing where they hit the, uh, the button? Well, I guess that's still Morse code. Telegraph, right? Telegraph, thank you. Yeah, telegraph, <laughs> radio type. So we're not, so even in those microcomputers I was working on, you could do little quick text messages. That's not what we're talking about. I'm not claiming I'm the inventor of electronic messaging. Okay, that mm -hmm. existed long before even computers existed. What I am, what I did do was I invented email, E-M-A-I-L, the system as we know it today, 
When you log into your email, what do you see? Inbox, outbox, folders, and you need all those components to communicate. And just to be clear, prior to 1993, before the web took off, mm -hmm. email existed in the office environment. People moved from the paper-based system to the email system. And in that environment, we don't need the internet, you don't need the app symbol, we use the dot, other people use the exclamation point. So the bottom line is, I converted that system, wrote 50,000 lines of code, wrote it in Fortran, had every feature. More importantly, the one thing I haven't expressed that I want to express here is in, at the university when I built this, I had seminars as a 14 year kid, thousands of people saw this solution. We weren't so into, we weren't into open innovation. We had uh, IBM. Hewlett Packard, everyone in there, we didn't make people sign secrecy documents, so a lot of people saw this. Second of all, I called it email, a term never used before in the English language, so I created email and I called it email. So that, that is that is another question, because I mean, that's that's uh, kind of astonishing, I think, that it, oh, this word email that, that we all use continuously every day, I, right? I, that, was, that was your creation. Uh, and it's an interesting, it was an idiosyncratic reason. Yes, it seems obvious, you know, when you look back, it seems obvious, but when I first coined that, I didn't even know how to pronounce it. I thought I should call it email. Let me tell you why. The Fortran language only allowed six characters for uh, variable naming. The Hewlett Packard operating system only allowed five. So imagine all the apps on your iPhone could only have five characters. Mm -hmm. That's where email came in. It's in the, you know, it's documented black and white. So I called an email, wrote 50,000 lines of code, had every feature working, no one had done this before, uh, hundreds of people in the universe used it, and then it gets even more important from an intellectual property standpoint. You know, in 1976, there was a Copyright Act of 1976. Again, the, the sort of the dumb politicians in Washington did not know what software was, they thought it was sheet music. So in 1980, they amended the Copyright Act of 1976 to allow you to use copyright to protect software. Now, I didn't know about this. You know, I won various awards. I was in the local newspaper, went off to MIT in 1981, was elected student, uh, freshman body council president, and I was invited to the president's home in 1981. In fact, when I first came to MIT, they highlighted three students of note, and I was one of them out of the 1,041 on the front page. When I went to the president's office, uh, house, he said, Shiva, it's unfortunate. The Supreme Court doesn't let you patent or recognize software patents. You should copyright it. So I rode away as a 17-year-old kid, got all the materials, and it wasn't simply as some very inane people had suggested because they want to diminish the invention. They thought you simply putting a C with a circle. I had to send all my code evolution, all my manuals. So somebody's life. saying right now, I'm an Army veteran in the comments. They're saying, I'm an Ar uh, Army veteran. I worked on this stuff in the early 80s. Uh, so, and that's a lot of the, that's a lot of the opposition that you have now that people are saying, oh, well, we already worked on messaging services. How do you, um, and I know you, you already sort of uh, uh, differentiated what you worked on. Is, is there a simplistic way of, of, the, of you actually just laying out uh, the big differences here? Yeah, here's a big difference, okay, the messaging systems, in fact, if you go to inventoredemail.com slash the facts, we have an army veteran in the Navy we said, you know, we had these teletype messaging systems on ships. That's not email, okay, because that's no different than what people, you know, is Twitter email? No, it uses the at symbol. Mm. Is when I send you a text message, is that email? No. Radio type existed in the 30s. That's not email, we're talking the key word. <clears throat> the problem in a lot of the educational systems right now, they don't teach what a system is. We're talking about the inner office mail system in electronic form. And I called it email, I defined it as email. I created and I invented email as we know it today. Messaging systems have existed for hundreds of years. That's not what we're talking about. And this is what those people who got very upset when my stuff went into the Smithsonian, you know, in 2011, my mom was dying. She had saved all this in a beautiful suitcase, gave it to me. Time Magazine, everyone, if you want to look it up, can look it up right now. Um, the only journalist who went through the material wrote a beautiful article called The Man Who Invented Email, Doug Amat, the senior editor. I never wanted any, again, fame for this. Um, then the Smithsonian contacted me, and they wanted all the materials. <clears throat> the day that it went into the Smithsonian, a young Washington Post reporter wrote, wrote a beautiful article, did videos. But that's when the proverbial you know, SHIT hit the fan, because this was as though a new skull had been found. During those 35 years that I didn't promote myself, the military-industrial complex, who believes they're the inventors of everything, um, including Raytheon and BBN, they had rewritten the narrative because they were making a ton of money 
of promoting themselves as a better, you know, particularly Raytheon with the at symbol, which is not, you know, not the base of defining what email is. So what you see is this huge explosion of interesting liberal elites mm -hmm. who attack the Washington Post reporter, and then they try to confuse people, saying, in fact, they changed it. They said Shiva is not the inventor of electronic messaging. I never claimed to be the inventor of electronic messaging. I am the inventor of email, the system as we know today. I wrote the 50,000 lines of code, I called it email, and by all rule of law, I received the first US copyright for email. Not the word, but the system as we know today. In fact, there's a user's manual. So people out there really need to sort of take a step back and recognize that they've been bamboozled by the elites that thinking all great innovation must come out of MIT, Silicon Valley, and all the elitist institutions. And what's fascinating is, Lucian, I was on the front page of MIT three or four times for inventing many other things. Mm -hmm. I didn't need this popularity. Technology Review had me on the front page when I invented another technology for analyzing email. I grew that to a $250 million company. I was on the front page when I won the Fulbright. I was on the front page when I came to MIT. I was on the front page of MIT for protesting many things. So I didn't need this notoriety or popularity. But the day that it went into the Smithsonian, even MIT got concerned because that means they don't own the hegemony on innovation. The fact is, a 14-year-old kid in Newark can invent email. A 14-year-old kid in Franklin, Idaho, by the way, invented TV. Same story. It was done not in the triangle of the military-industrial-academic complex, but it was done in the triangle of a loving family, the public school system before the Department of Education screwed it up, and a mentor. And that's America. The invention of email is an American story, and to deny that is basically putting everything back to big business, big corporation. That's what Elizabeth Warren wants to do. The elites want to make us think that nothing can be built by the individual, that it all is built by them. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, I uh, may share with you, I got a Wikipedia editor. By the way, they hire people on Wikipedia. We actually, we have a, we have a and you know, you broached an incredible topic. We, uh, we have that wonderful Elizabeth Warren uh, speech or talk, I don't know what you want to call it, um, but Elizabeth Warren right. discussing right. discussing her views sure. on um, on a perfect transition uh, on American innovation and how that relates back to government according to her. So let's uh, let's watch that briefly. I hear all this, you know, well, this is class warfare, this is what No, there is nobody in this country who got rich on his own. Nobody. You built a factory out there. Good for you, but I want to be clear. You moved your goods to market on the roads the rest of us paid for. You hired workers the rest of us paid to educate. You all uh, were safe in your factory because of police forces and fire forces that the rest of us paid for. You didn't have to worry that marauding bands would come and seize everything at your factory and hire someone to protect against this because of the work the rest of us did. Now look, you built a factory and it turned into something terrific or a great idea. God bless. Keep a big Okay, and we'll end it there because you know that that entire that entire thing just pisses me off. You take a um, of that and pay for now so uh, essentially what Warren's saying, what your challenger, your potential challenger is saying, right? You didn't invent email. Uh, the people who used it invented it and their taxes invented it. Uh, the community invented it. I mean, it's it's this. Is Elizabeth Warren a, a communist? Is, should we be at, scared that she is currently in office? And what do you intend to do differently? Well, here, here's the bottom line with Elizabeth Warren. You're talking about an idiot who's never invented anything. Okay? It really pisses me off when I hear her because she's a lawyer lobbyist who made money from foreclosures, who made money as a self-serving elitist by actually stepping in line in front of someone else who should have gotten her job at Harvard. And so she believes in cutting in front of line. So this woman is a- For people who don't know how she got her job at Harvard, can you, can you fill us in? Yeah, so, so you have a situation in 1995, Elizabeth Warren uh, wants to get a job at Harvard. Problem, she's not qualified. So what does she do? She checks off the fact that she's a Native American. Problem number two, she's not a Native American. And this was done as a collusion between her and Harvard University because they got to say they got a nice Native American there. She and her husband got to work at the same institute. That is how she got in and that's how she works. So she has no business talking about how the people work and how, what she cares about people. What this woman cares about is herself 
and her particular group of Brahmins in the area that she lives. And she lives, frankly, a couple of, you know, miles, less than a half a mile from here. So I have been fighting these people, Lucian, all my life, even in India, the quote unquote upper caste thinking they know everything, everyone else is stupid. And that's what Elizabeth Warren thinks. She thinks she knows better, but I know you know better. And that's the fundamental difference. And that's America. If you look at the founders of this country, they believe they were children of the enlightenment and they believe between us and our creator, and they had the concept of a creator, which was not as an ideologue, but there was a creator who put into place natural law, which was gravity and, you know, kinetic, you know, and we, our job as human beings was supposed to use our mind, our brain and our soul to discover those laws. And out of that, we were supposed to take bold risks as individuals to innovate and create. And their goal was to eliminate everything in between that. They did not believe in centralized government. They believed in the individual. Mm -hmm. And these guys were soldiers, blacksmiths, innovators, architects. They were not fake career politicians. That is what Elizabeth Warren is. And they did not believe in centralization of power. Everything, what she, the speech you just said is completely anti-American. Because what it's saying is, we believe in the centralization of power, that the individual is reduced to nothing, and that the individual has no effect in the change of history. And this is absolute nonsense. And so, so, so what what would you, based on how, how she's, uh, she's conducted herself, handled herself, the narrative she's setting, what would you do differently? Well, first of all, what I would do is, you know, at, 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 you know, I believe we need term limits in, you know, in, in, in this country. You know, you know, I'm not looking to make a career out of this. Uh, you know, people like her are looking for career positions. The fun, one of the fundamental things we need to do is, if you look at Massachusetts, all the screaming and yelling she's been doing, she, you know, and all the other swamp creatures in Massachusetts. One thing they do not want to talk about is there's a 17 to one ratio between, for every 17 jobs that are open. Lucian, there's only one person who's skilled. Think mm -hmm. about that. You know, what, what would you do differently, though? I, I, because a lot of people were asking about uh, policy you'd set, uh, set so, forth. So let me say, so, so if Boston, Massachusetts is supposed to be the mecca of education, we have a major problem here. We haven't produced enough skilled labor. And the reason that has been done is, first of all, all these universities get students. I, I think we should eliminate student loans completely. Mm -hmm. Okay. The student loan model has enabled people like Elizabeth Warren to make $350,000 for teaching one course. What it has done is starting around the 70s, 80s when it peaked as we started pushing student loans. So you got into some university, right away your parents got hit with a loan. And what's funny is the loan never went to the student. It went right from the Sally Mae right to the government. So universities just kept cranking up their, their tuitions. So we have now is students graduating college with 30, 40, 50, 100K loans, and they're living in their parents' basement, but more importantly, they have no skills. You know, I run many businesses. I can't, you know, I can't tell you how difficult it is to find people. And you, you did this by yourself, by the way. Uh, your, your first job at that university and, and your entire education, it was, is, it was self-fulfilled. You weren't applying for, uh, as, as a real Indian, you weren't applying for all those grants, or maybe you were. I don't know. No, I, I've always worked. So one thing about me, everyone should understand, is I've been working full time since I was 14 years old. When I was uh, 18, I bought my own house. When I went, even though I was, going, I went in and out of. You bought a house at 18. Yeah, because, huh? I bought my own house because I was always doing software. Was it a nice house? Yes, uh, you know, I gave it to my parents. In fact, I just rented it. I bought another home here. <laughs> That's um, nice. You know, I went to MIT in and out of there. Four degrees. Where Where is it? Is the rent good? Can I move it? Yeah, you can come on in. I, 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 I think uh, we have some other people that are going to The bottom line is, Lucian, is people like Elizabeth Warren the politicians, the swamp creatures, they all need to leave, and that's why they're so distressed with Donald Trump. Because here's a guy, look, who's actually built stuff. You know, anyone who's built a software company, who's built a construction company, you live in chaos. You have to make things run and work and hire, fire, mm -hmm. and you have to actually create things. And none of these guys know how to do that. So that Elizabeth Warren speech is so disgusting because she's never ever had to pay payroll in, or build a company. So she doesn't even know what the word build is. So it's all theory to that. And the, the liberal elite live on theory. They don't, they don't live on reality. And they have a problem with me because they can't call me a white supremacist. They can't call me a racist. 
I'm the guy that doesn't want to be on the plantation. That's why the invention of the email problem is so difficult for them, because I fight back. I'm not willing to be a dunga din. I'm not willing to be a you know a uh, house slave and acknowledge, oh, I didn't invent email. No, I did invent email, and I didn't do it at MIT. I did it in a small university in Newark, New Jersey, with everyday people who helped, you know, who supported me. It wasn't you. It wasn't the big institutions. So Elizabeth Warren is about acceding all our power back to the big institutions because she would not be able to survive in the real world. She's got her nice health care program. She's got her tenured, you know, uh, you know, fellowship over at Harvard. These people cannot survive on their own. So they have to uh, pay obeisance to the big guys, you know, because that's where they get power. And what's really disgusting is on top of that, they keep saying they want to support the small guys. That's what I find fascinating. What she did with Dodd Frank was to consolidate power back to big banks. Twelve hundred community banks were destroyed. Obamacare has destroyed tens of thousands of local community doctors where health is delivered. And Sorbane's Oxley, which she also supports, has mm. destroyed many, many small businesses because you can't afford the auditing fees. So, so the first the first policy you'd implement, you'd propose, uh, if you say you got the job. Say the American uh, uh, Massachusetts constituency uh, elected you, right? You have the job. You're sitting at that that brand new desk that uh, Elizabeth Warren was was uh, doing whatever she was doing on it. And uh, what what do you sign? What do you do? Well, first I first I change the furniture there and probably do a very <laughs> good um, like a ceremony, a saging. <laughs> <laughs> Get rid of all the, the evil energy in that room. That's, no, seriously, I I, I do that. Believe in something. That's the first thing I would do before I even enter that. Room. I like, you know, I, I have. Uh, what do I have? I got sage right here. That's it's one of my rituals. Yeah, you know the other thing is camphor. In India, we use camphor. It's a beautiful tree, very much like sage. It's a cleansing herb. <laughs> can anyway. now uh, can you? Uh, I'm sure we can all acknowledge the the uh, sage inflation that the left has been pushing. Um, <laughs> Or would you be able to maybe uh, make Sage available in your campaign store? Can we get it for a better yeah, price? You know, we are, I actually run a, a, a non, uh, an institute I run for training people about systems. So we're thinking of actually offering Sage, Camper, all sorts of Shiva products. <laughs> that actually models that you can sell on the computer. We're actually figuring out what works and what doesn't. We're going to disrupt the nutritional industry, but we could offer that. I like I like it. I, I mean, I I purchased some of that. Give give me a sage at a good price, and you have a customer. Yeah. Um. Okay. So let's let's get uh to the one of the biggest questions that uh that was pushed through Gateway Pundit and uh a question that was asked from many many of our readers was about your last appearance on the Howie Carr show, where he he brought up those documents, the the mugshot. The arrest and uh, the claim from a lot of these people is that that automatically disqualifies uh, disqualifies you that you have this this record that uh, invalidates any sort of run. Um, and then actually, even before I play this clip, as as an ultra lead up, uh, what a lot of people have said, which is interesting. Um, is that uh, that what that that the Democrats have put in a plant on the right? Okay, that somebody is running as a Republican specifically to with, with the intention of being defeated by uh, by Warren, so that she could uh, uh, applaud herself, her her uh, adherents could applaud, and um, and it be an easy victory. So. Half half of these people they're saying, oh, maybe maybe she was a plant. The other half they're saying it's steel, um, and they're using this specific clip, which we're going to pull up in a second here, uh, as as rationale that you couldn't win. We're going to play the clip, and then uh, would you comment on it? All right. Sure. Elizabeth Warren, you want to get your ratings. But do you want to defeat Elizabeth Warren? So you're not, you're not do you want to defeat that. Elizabeth do Warren? Have, do we have, do you want to defeat Elizabeth Warren? Who is this? I'm going to show you. Do you want to defeat picture. Elizabeth Warren? I do. And you? No, you don't. If you, you don't want to defeat Elizabeth, 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 Elizabeth Warren, Warren. Picture. you don't want to defeat Elizabeth Warren, Howie. What you, you want to do is to be a guy who do not want to defeat Elizabeth Warren. charged 
You do not want to defeat Elizabeth Warren, do you? You do not want to sit in the bed that you were you know, you know, Howie, do you want to defeat Elizabeth Warren? You want me to show you this you, picture? You can show whatever you want. You were and arrested. Do you want? You just told do me you wanted to do you arrested. So you said, lied. No. You, you, you lied. absolutely said. You, you know lied what? and said you were never arrested. Do you want to defeat Elizabeth Warren? Okay, so you never, you never, there we go. There we go. So essentially, I will say it's, uh, people keep saying it's um, just my input. Uh... He, he keeps repeating the same thing over and over, and then you keep repeating the same thing over and over. I don't think either of you, to be completely honest, handled that very well. Um, yeah. looking, looking back on that clip, looking back on this clip that people keep circulating, would you have, would you have actually, uh, would you have jumped in? Would you have done anything differently? Were you completely caught off guard? Uh, I mean, explain the background here. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, so let's let's just put all of this in context, right? So we're looking at, if, you know, we're looking at one frame in a movie, right? Mm -hmm. That scene that you played was one frame in a movie. Let me tell you, um, you may remember, Lucian, I announced that I was going to run for U.S. Senate on February 24th at the Bull Moose Party. at had a very uh, cool group of people who are anti-establishment. And fundamentally, I'm the anti-establishment candidate, right? And what I mean by that is, I'm an outsider, I'm not part of the swamp in Massachusetts. And what's very interesting is when I announced, you know, I was expecting the GOP to say, wow, this is a cool guy, let's talk to him. I didn't hear from them for two months. In fact, when I met with them, and the only reason that meeting with the GOP in Massachusetts took place was my lawyer, who a good friend has raised a ton of money for them, said, how come you're not talking to Shiva? So when they met with me, they, six of them, you know, some of the leadership surrounded me, and they said, oh, so who did you vote for? That I voted for Trump, and they were aghast that I voted for Trump. So think about that. This is the Massachusetts Republican GOP upset that I voted for Trump. Now, mm -hmm. we knew we weren't going to get any support from them. Howie Carr and another guy, Cooner, are the two main radio stations in Boston who reach all the working class people, and the Boston Globe and the Herald are the mainstream media. I'm running, I'm the first declared candidate, Lucian. No one else has declared. They give me very minimal press. Every major Republican town committee we go to speak, we would always get amazing standing ovations. You can you can see some of them. The Cape Cod Republican Club. In spite of them, Lucian, we started getting all this press. Fox News, right? Fox and Friends, through our own efforts by you know sending Elizabeth Warren a DNA test kit. She didn't. You're skating. She went, you're skating around. You're skating yeah. around the actual thing. I hope you just yeah, skate yeah, back. Skate no, back no, to no, what what this is about. It, my point is, if you look at this, this uh -huh. is what was going on leading up to the Howie Carr event. Okay, we had almost 50 million impressions without Howie Carr. Now, so two developments were taking place. A in spite of Howie Carr, who everyone said, well, you need Howie Carr to win in Massachusetts. We're getting all this explosive press. Separate from that, over those 100 days, from GOP operatives and Trump loyalists, we started realizing something very unique, which we also put out there, which was this. I don't know if you can see this. This yeah. is a meme that some of our followers put out. And what you see in this meme is something quite compelling. It's Charlie Baker and Elizabeth Warren, two never Trumpers, using their strings, including the Howie Carr Show, including the Herald, to support this dope, di dirty deal. As I, what, what, what I, okay, so, regardless, regardless of why, of why, uh, or what, I mean, obviously, politics is a dirty, is a dirty game, right? Um, it's a dirty game. But here, here's the thing, there is a mugshot that exists, a very cute mugshot that exists of you. Right. Um, there, there is something behind that mugshot. You were, you were in fact uh, uh, arrested, and then I will say it looks like you were, you were arrested. Uh, by, I also prefer the hair cut uh, thing that's going on there. I wish you, you'd bring that back. Um, but whatever happened, there's obviously a story behind it. And what a lot of people are waiting for is to actually hear how that happened, what happened on the uh, the Howie Carr show. You. Um, you know, I, I don't know, I think both you, you and, uh, and Carr mishandled it. I think he kept repeating the same thing, you kept repeating the same thing. So rather than, rather than about Warren or anything else, I want to know what, what's behind this, uh, this cute picture right. of you. So, so what I'm trying to tell you is there's a time point there. We're not, so for 10 times we're trying to get on the Howie Carr show. Yeah. He's had Deal on there about 7 or 10 times. In fact, Deal is hosting it. 
my opponent who has not even yet to declare. Now, I think that's unfair. The Friday before this event, we went to what's called a Friday morning group. I was a fourth speaker, Carr was the next speaker. Mm -hmm. And I said, you know, isn't what separates Republicans from the Democrats meritocracy? I said, how unfortunate is it that I'm leading in Massachusetts against Warren? And I haven't been on the Howie Carr show once. Get but back I, to the image. I want I to know. I wouldn't, you're still not doing it. Right. So the next Monday, you have to understand there's two, two events with Howie Carr. The mm -hmm. next Monday, Howie gets on his uh, talk show and he starts attacking me for two hours. And they suddenly called me and they said, do you want to be on the show now? And I'm you know, going to lunch. I said, I said, are you going to put me on the show as a normal person so I could come into your studio and talk like you've done for deal ten times? And they, and they say, no, we want you on there right now. I said, this is a setup. When you want to really have me on the show, I'll do that. Two days later, I believe it was a Thursday on the 18th, is that when it was? Uh, I was asked to be on the show. Shiva, now, in, the, in the chat, they're asking you to get back to what actually happened. Yeah, I went into that show, Lucian, with sincerity that we're going to discuss policy. How he brings up right away this mugshot. Now you have to understand, when that mugshot was brought up, I was advised by many, many people, Carr is a bully and a coward, mm. and he's gonna to try to detract you from not Warren issues, but to bring you up on many other issues. He says various lies in that. He said that I said he was sleeping with a woman, false. He said I did not say I was not arrested, false. I was not gonna get pulled into his nonsense. So if you read that show, they were manipulating my mic, and at one point, when I'm yelling at him, saying I want to bring back the issues, he cut, his producer throws us out. I don't know if this was on there. Howie Carr said that uh, the history behind that mugshot is that you you abused a woman, you were arrested for that. Yeah, can you can you right. just address, I want you to yeah. just address right. uh, the, what's right. going on there, rather than... I mean, right. you know, Howie, Howie Carr, he's, he's, uh, he's a funny radio guy. Um, also with with uh, I don't know I you know I could criticize his haircut too, uh, right? So so I want to give the people a background because so the net of it is we're growing we don't need Howie Carr so this was a desperate attack. Let me be very clear to everyone. I the history, Shiva, Shiva, my God, dude, the history. I want to hear. Everybody yeah, wants uh, to hear I'm what's behind that photo. So I never attacked a woman. That photo was an arrest that took place, which was outright dismissed outright dismissed by, not me, but by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the person who had made the complaint. And this never got out to the media. In fact, after how we knew about it, he took ads out with my photograph, implying that I beat up someone. I've never beat up anyone in my life, never would beat up anyone, and anyone who would do that and has been convicted should be prosecuted to the highest extent of the law. That was the most despicable thing that they could have done to try right. to implicate me, because when you can't attack someone legitimately, you try to attack their character. So the the, the all the charges behind that, uh, they they were they were. Uh, did they ever go to court? Were they dropped? Um, yes. Yeah, so let me tell you, these were potential. It, it's all public. It was potential mm -hmm. assaults, and I'm not going to disparage the woman because if I were to tell the truth about what took place, I would be disparaging that person. I'm not going to do that. But the bottom line is. It was outright dismissed. And the reason I use the word outright dismissed is the following. When people actually do do something wrong, they do what's called a continuance. They let it go on and they strike some deals. On the date the trial was to be held, it was outright dismissed mm -hmm. by the Commonwealth of Massachusetts and the complaint. Anyone wants to go do that? Now, Howie Carr never brought that up. Never brought it up. And that's what occurred. And what's very interesting is that, you know, I know what it feels like to be falsely accused. And we live mm -hmm. in a culture now where that's what this culture is about. It's about fake news and false accusations, and it's about using that to destroy people when they actually start getting down to truth. And my entire life, Lucian, has been about fighting for truth. You know, when I went to India on my Fulbright, I've gone through this before. This is not new. Howie mm -hmm. Carr is a little flea for me, okay? He's a little swamp creature, and he plays both sides. You know, after we exposed him as a fake Trump, he ran off on a little tricycle to go get a photo taken with President Trump. Who, I want to know, uh, who was that woman um, that I, I had that had you arrested, that had you, um, can you give us more background on that? Because obviously, I, I, I this is... You, and I, look, I, all I can tell you is I can't go into the details of that, because if I were to go down that, I would... So why, why wouldn't this hurt you if you're running against Warren? And what a lot of people said 
is that they're going to pull up this mugshot. Um, let them pull it up, Lucian. Here's the truth. We don't live in Sharia law, do we? We have American law. And what that means is you're innocent till proven guilty. This thing was outright dismissed. Let them pull up that mugshot all day So long. it was dismissed, and, and uh, the woman who brought this up, she also dropped the charges. If you go read it, not only did the Commonwealth drop it, but she dropped it on the date the trial was to be held. All I can tell you is we live in a world now where false accusation and fake news, you know, you look at what happened to Julian Assange when he started yeah. exposing the swamp. When Donald Trump exposes the swamp, they become Russian police. When Shibai Dre exposes the, the sewer that feeds the Washington swamp, and that's what we did, Lucian. We exposed the collusion between Baker and Warren and the media because I'm an outsider, and they have no interest in me even getting on the ballot here. So here we have 50 million hits online. We're exposing all of these guys. So this is what they did. In fact, we exposed Deal, the fake Photoshop picture I think you said. Mm. And by the way, no mainstream media has picked up on That's it. True. We exposed the fact that he says he's a Trump co-chair, and he's not. But let me tell you, my background is when I went to India on my Fulbright, it too, everyone can read about him, a very controversial mm. guy, very transparent. I was appointed by the Prime Minister of India's office to run the largest innovation center. Beautiful bungalow in Delhi. I was going to do this for a couple of years. I exposed the depths of corruption in the Indian government. I was under death threats, I had to leave India. Mm. And what they said was this guy wanted more money. They tried to put fake news out. So I've gone through this. When I exposed the fact that, you know, the fake history of historians, uh, of who invented email, Gawker Media, all these guys call me a fraud, asshole, dick. I think I can use that on your thing. All <laughs> sort of sensible stuff. Went on for four years, and we sued and we settled. I got close to, I got $750,000, and three articles were pulled down. And more recently, I exposed the fake science of Monsanto. In fact, I exposed academics. You're talking to someone who's a fighter, and I'm going to drop truth bombs all day long. They can bring on mugshots, they can bring on anything, but they're not going to stop me because you're looking at a guy who's going to expose him. And my entire life has been about truth, and truth is a weapon. And that's what bothers him. So they had to pull up a mugshot of a guy who did nothing wrong, never hurt any woman, false accusations, outright dismissed. That's the facts. And let them so that, that never actually went to court. It was a mugshot that was immediately dismissed. Is that is that what you're saying? And then court records court records would back up what you're saying, right? Excuse me? Would court court records would back up yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that that was dismissed immediately? If you go get them. And you know it's really funny. I, you know, I was you know, I have to be careful because you know I have you know I, I've done pretty well what I say against someone else. So the next day, I literally, with my assistant who's right here, we went down to the courthouse. We had to get those documents, take it to my attorney. And my By attorney the way, attorney, just to, you know, not to interrupt you, but somebody in the chat said, uh, American whites should mix more with Indians, then we'd all be super smart. Well, you know, <laughs> I, believe, I, I, you know, I believe in strong borders, but, but within our borders, I believe in total, you know, integration, man. <laughs> I mean, that nice brown hue would create a, a Now, was was the uh, uh, was this a, a white? You know, white women can be very uh, mean spirited. Was it a white woman, a woman that you were dating who who filed that report? <laughs> oh my God! Yeah. Well, you know, I don't know if I should answer that, but I think people can guess. guess. I let me put it to you this way: I've only dated one Indian woman in my life. Okay. <laughs> 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 um, I, I I mean I will say part of part of the part of the claims there um, in the report was that that what that you were uh, you were abusive and aggressive and I I will say just just uh, from my own perspective I, I was friends with the vast majority of Indians I knew uh, they lived in the sub uh, the suburbs they were very passive very intelligent and very pa uh, in terms of aggression very passive. Uh, and they, they, uh, yeah, they were, they were chill people. They, some of them invent email. <laughs> um, so I, I don't know. I, I think it's, uh, it's very weird that that one mugshot, uh, emerged as you were gaining popularity. And obviously as you're experiencing right now, um, that is sort of how, how running for any sort of office works. Uh, I do wish, you know, I think everybody would love a couple have, more details on that. The violation that I have, Lucian, so we should get it out of the way now, full mm -hmm. disclosure. I also had a dog license issue, 
which we took care of. My dog one time got away, and we had to put his dog license on. So that's explosive news, you know? I, you know, I don't want my dog's mugshot out there. <laughs> um, okay, so... <laughs> Um, I don't know. Do you do you have any do you have anything? So you you think how you know Howie Carr? I uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna push back there, and I I do think he's he's a solid conservative. I didn't really look into his entire history uh, as to whether or not he supported Trump and for what duration. Um, well, I don't even think this is about Howie. We should look. You know, there's a lot of people. You know, we can talk about Rice uh, Priebus has pictures with Trump. In. Mm -hmm. You know, come on. You know, this is not the issue. The issue is not Howie Carr. The issue is not me. The issue is a fact. How are you going to defeat uh, Elizabeth Warren? Well, the way we're going to defeat her, first of all, is we're going to run a just like I've done very well in business, or, or, or Trump has done very well in business. We're not going to run a conventional campaign because the reality that the reason our campaign has picked up so much steam is because we're exposing the swamp here. The rhinos and the Democrats have no interest in beating Warren. Let's be very, very frank about it. The people that are running, deal, he's looking through his pack to make a ton of money. The guy couldn't win a state senate seat. As a political guy. outsider, how are you going to, if you if you get elected, how are you going to hop into the system and correct that? How are you actually going to fix what, what you see is a problem? Right, so so I believe there's, a, there's people in Washington, you know, the number one thing that drives things is the money, right? All mm. the money, economics. Right now, what we stand right now is we have about, you know, if you look at the uh, numbers, we have about a $20 trillion debt. Uh, we have people in this country who are uneducated to take on the jobs of the 21st century. So the first thing we have to do is we have to re-educate people. So one of the number one things, you know, coming from Massachusetts is we have to take community colleges and we have to give them the ability to get four-year four degree programs. We have to make sure associate's degrees are allowed. We have to make sure that we eliminate the need for people to go to four-year colleges to have to get their medical degrees. We need to eliminate student loans. We need to re-implement. This is one thing that I read, among many things that I really like what the president's doing, is the apprenticeship programs. We need to mm -hmm. unleash Botech schools. We don't have enough plumbers. We don't have enough med techs, enough cy cytotechs. We don't have enough nurses. We don't have enough doctors. What Obamacare has done is a corporatization of medicine. So it's taken away competition. I'm not talking about insurance competition. I'm talking about medical care competition. So we need to unleash a number of doctors, we need to unleash a number of engineers, scientists, med techs, all those people. We have a serious problem with that. If we don't address that in Massachusetts, for example, it's gonna become like Connecticut. More importantly, we have a $200 trillion, forget the $20 trillion we're talking about in debt or the $1.2 trillion in student loans uh, bubble. We're talking about $200 trillion in municipal bonds that are gonna fail. And all of this comes down to the fact we do not have people skilled for the 21st century. I know what it takes to get skilled. You're talking to a guy who is an information technology pioneer, who's built a biotech business, who's had to hire people. I'm a representative, anything, of Massachusetts, which is the center of technology, the center of education, the center of medicine, and actually is a guy who's been working. None of these politicians know this. They're unqualified to represent us for the 21st century. And that's what I can do. Our, our, our fundamentals are we need real jobs, real education, real health. And, we're, and we have to do it clean, clean air, clean food, clean government. What's interesting about our campaign, Lucian, is mm. it's not left or quote unquote right. It's not liberal or conservative. So on the one hand, if you look at my videos, I completely expose the whole BS of climate change. And I can do that as a system scientist. And that uh, Donald Trump, President Trump did amazing by pulling it out. But at the same time, you know, the, the right, quote unquote, right will love me for that. But the quote unquote left also likes me for the fact that I'm using science and rational thought, I've exposed the fact there's no safety assessment standards for genetically engineered foods. I'm not against pro or anti GMO, but I can tell you that Monsanto has completely colluded with most of the politicians. Elizabeth Warren, and people should hear this, voted for the Monsanto Protection Act. She voted for the Monsanto Protection Act, which allows the executive branch to overrule a federal court judge if they put injunctions on the safety of genetic engineered foods. So you have a guy, I'm using science, and I can expose the BS of the power supports, but I can also expose the BS of you know, Monsanto. At the same time, I believe in organic food, but I also believe we should all have the right to weapons and the Second Amendment. So these things may seem contradictory. And finally, I'm an immigrant, but I believe in 
definitely strong borders. You see, so I'm that kind of candidate who can't be bought. I make my own money. I'm not in anyone's ideological pocket. I'm going to do what's truly right. You know, right means truth. And that's what the right is supposed to be about. And I think this is what scares the swamp or the sewer in Massachusetts, because I can't be bought by the rhinos. I can't be, you know, a, an agent of collusion for each one of them. I'm my own personal solution. I've been doing this all my life. If people go to Shiva for Senate, they'll You know, I, I will say, I did notice that about you. As you were uh, climbing in popularity, as you uh, garnered more and more support from just average Americans, uh, there was a huge push against you. Um, and it was, it was it, by, I believe, the establishment. Uh, yeah, the establishment. And it, it, it did happen, it did happen all at once. And, you know, they're, they're pulling out um, the left. I, I think the left is terrified of you. Uh, and their, their ammunition is the, uh, is what? The, oh, did he or did he not invent email? Um, my God, I, I would love, and you should do this live to everybody who, who uh, just show them that, Two-hour-long presentation you showed me earlier, um, and then they will, they will never challenge you again. Well, when I, um, I did it at one of the most liberal things, a Deepak Chopra event, with mm -hmm. all the Hollywood celebrities. At some point, we should publish that standing ovation. 20% of the audience was crying at the end of it because they found it so screwed up that the fact is a 14-year-old kid invented email, and the nonsense I had to go through to get that out, and this was done by liberal institutions. Well, I'll tell you what, um, as as uh, the American representative for all white Americans, uh, and, you know, white Americans have invented the vast majority of things, we will give you email. Uh, that's yours now. <laughs> um, <laughs> we'll acknowledge that you did create it. You're welcome. <laughs> you know, one of the things I want to let you know is uh, Indians are actually caucus I don't know if you know that racially. So in that case, you could say white people also that. Okay, you know, well that's that's good. Well, uh, then we'll take it back. Thank you. Thank you for giving it back to us. <laughs> the other interesting thing is, I actually had my DNA test done, mm -hmm. and it turns out I actually do have American Indian blood in me, in addition to Indian Indian blood. So I so I have point little bits. I'm a little feather and a lot of dot, and in fact, I'm related to the Yakuts in Upper Siberia who came over. So you're talking to someone who actually is a real, real Indian. So some people can say, oh, he's an Indian American. He's not a native. Well, guess what? I'm both. Wait, so, okay. So that would be on your father's side. You did say that you're, uh, are you first generation or no? No, I, I'm an immigrant, man. I came Yeah, okay. So you're first, uh, wait, so somehow a Native American, okay, I'm going to challenge this one. A Native American moved to India, right? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> impregnated your mom, and then you guys decided to move well, back. Turns out around the 16th, I have to go more into According to the genetic, around 1600s, there was some tomfoolery that took place. We don't know where it was. But you see, my dad lived in Burma. And Burma, if you look at the Burmese people, mm. right, their background, you know, is, you know, they have teepees there, you know, there's a whole, the, the, the or, it's a Mongolians, right, in that area. But the point is, bottom line is, I have Native American blood in me, a little bit, but I also have, you know, uh, South Asian blood in me. Um, and I think the bigger issue here is when we say the real Indian against the fake Indian illusion, we're talking about real versus fake. I think the reason people like Indian is it makes it manifest. Here's a real guy, a real Indian, and fake Indian, but you're talking about this deeper issue of a real person who worked hard, you know, paid his dues, fought, for America, continues to fight uh, fake news, fake science, you know, and that's very different than these career politicians. They're in there to get their next job, and that's what they're about. We're more than likely going to have four other candidates in this race, a guy we call him Old Man Kingston, mm -hmm. another Trumper, and another one we call Beth Lindstrom, you know, another old Beth, you know, Liz Elizabeth, and then we'll have Deal. So I'm looking forward to this, and we're here to expose this sewer revolution because the sewer in Massachusetts, you know, remember aliens, when they, remember when they go to that movie, they find all those eggs, those yeah. little hack things? Well, that's what this two-mile radius is here. This is where they hatch all the swamp creatures that end up going to Washington. And I really believe by my winning here, which we're going to do, we're going to deliver a massive defeat, and it's going to be important for this country because it's going to be a real Indian against a fake Indian, a real innovator, and a real fighter.
So I'm excited about this. So, okay, uh, somebody did just ask, um, how confident are you in uh, a debate against Jeff Deal? Would you oh, would you propose asked, that? Have you been yeah, asking for that? We've asked people that, uh, to debate with us. I, uh, I did the first talk I did. I was invited to a, the Norfolk Republican Club. Uh, one guy spoke. I spoke. Then Deal. I got all the claps. People wanted to get all you know uh, photographs of me. Deal had to run between his uh, tail between his legs. He was a wet dish rag. He can't speak. Um, I don't even know why this guy's running. And the reason is he's running because Baker has appointed him. And I, I, again, I think. This is the data that we have on the ground. Deal is a fake Trumper. Mm. He is promoting himself as a chairman. Uh, he was a co-chair of the Massachusetts for Trump. Absolute lie. Vincent DeVito, and everyone listening to this can talk to Vincent DeVito, was the only Massachusetts chair. Now they're trying to say he was an honorary chair. They're playing around with games. Second thing is, when we hit him, that Trump really didn't like him. He put forward that fake Photoshop picture. So what you're talking about is, he, using his fake Trump status, he was going to run against governor, against Charlie Baker, who's a never Trump or Republican governor. And Baker and him have a collusion, you know, uh, controlled opposition. Mm -hmm. So Deal was supposed to run for Senate, throw the election to Warren, and Warren will throw him a softball uh, against. That's what's going on. And everyone knows this, who's, who's operative. This is not some conspiracy theory. That's what's going on. And we expose that hard through that meme, and that's what they don't like. They think they're going to run their little club here, and Shiva Dure is throwing a little, uh, you know, is sort of screwing up their party. So, you know, mugshot's got to get released. Um, okay, so here's, you know, we're going to do a fire round and then close out, uh, unless we have any other quick questions. Okay, I'm going to ask you, what are these? One, two, three, four, five. Five different things. Give me quick uh, statements on each thing. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay, um, the leaguers in D.C., the leaguers within the Trump administration, thoughts? Get rid of them fast, you know? Very, very fast. Obamacare. Repeal. Repeal, destroy, throw in the garbage. has nothing to do with health care. Straight up repeal and then figure out, uh, figure it out later? I mean, yeah, we're, we're all better off not having it. You know, pay your local doctor, it's garbage. Uh, Russia. Just one more, one more question. Russia. Look, you know, this whole thing is a complete diversion. You know, we have a lot in common with the Russian people. You know, by the way, Putin got rid of GMOs, okay? Uh, I like Putin, frankly, you know? So this is a complete diversion. It's fake news. And the President of the United States is, in a long time, the first guy who's completely blowing up the swamp. And we need to all get behind Donald Trump and support him. You know, the stock market's up. He's delivering on his promises. And the swamp creatures are flailing. And we cannot eat. I, I, don't, I think we should all shut off the TV when Russia comes on and destroy all their ratings. <laughs> uh, okay, next one. The wall. Look, uh, you know, I'm a biologist, okay? You know, a PhD in biological engineering. Mm -hmm. Everything in nature has a wall. We have 10 trillion cells in our body. Every cell has a cell, uh, to be specific, a cell membrane. It decides what comes in and what goes out. The atmosphere has a wall, right? Hollywood elites, when I was out in Hollywood, all have walls. So anyone who does not believe in a wall should probably get on the other side of the wall. Because are you, are you, even conservatives, I will say, as a follow-up to that one, even conservatives are saying they're disappointed that Trump hasn't pushed the wall uh, through sooner than uh, is currently going on. Do you have, do you have a comment there? Are you are you disappointed? I, I think you know. Look, you're talking you're talking about a president who's being shelled every day. Every day that Donald Trump is in office is a victory for the American people. Every day, and we shouldn't be measuring him on uh, did this bill get passed or did that bill get passed right now. Mm -hmm. We should be measuring on the fact that how he's moving forward with confidence and pushing forward the agenda. This is phenomenal. This has never occurred before in a long time in American history. So I'm very enthused. I know he's working on the wall from everything I know. I know that he's got some amazing designs that came in. We may actually do a hackathon. You know, I have a beautiful space here in uh, Cambridge. I have my own building here. Uh, one of our MIT guys is running a, running a hackathon where we're going to come up with wall designs, and we may call it the green wall, like the green wall in, uh, in uh, Fenway. So we're going to come up with our own designs, and uh, we're going to run a hackathon here uh, this summer. Love it. Okay. Um, 
Last, last question. Actually, this is an abstract one, so you can you can uh, go to town here. Somebody just asked me to uh, to ask you about the First Amendment. So, however, you, what, what do you what do you, we'll, great, we'll do? Great question. <laughs> it's a great question, and it's actually related back to email in some very interesting way. Mm -hmm. Look, the First Amendment was put in place by our founding fathers so you or I could write stuff against our government, right? Mm -hmm. So we could write a leaflet. We could uh, challenge the government. It wasn't, when they envisioned it, it wasn't supposed to be New York Times and Wall Street Journal, multi-billion dollar companies writing fake news and then lying under the cover of the First Amendment when they write false statements, when they defame and libel people. Mm -hmm. That was not the basis of the First Amendment. The Supreme Court has ruled on this. Another important side, side point of the First Amendment is, it's going to sound a little bit uh, different, but it's the Postal Service. When the founders set up uh, this great country, they created a thing called the Postal Service, which was you or I could transact a piece of mail, and no one would interfere with that. In fact, it's a 20-year life sentence in prison if anyone interacts with mail, right? Mail fraud. In fact, there's the Office of the Inspector General. The reason I know this is, uh, I did a big project for the Postal Service many years ago when I was figuring out ways that they could get out of their bankruptcy. But more mm -hmm. importantly, when it comes to email, is this. When uh, the web took off in 93, and we had Hotmail, Yahoo, Gmail come, no one bothers to read their privacy statements, right? You get quote unquote free email. When we do that free email transaction, we're giving up our freedom because Google, Yahoo, Hotmail actually own our email. Now think about it. In 1997, email volume overtook postal mail volume. But we don't have the same rights that we had with postal mail. So First Amendment is important, but the fact is all of our email is being watched and monitored and we lost significant privacy. And people like Hillary Clinton can have private email servers. So what we're going to see in this world is the elites have private email servers and the rest of us, our stuff is going to be watched. And I think I have some solutions for this actually. Mm -hmm. There's new mesh network technologies and we need to have some of the ages of the Postal Service of those rules being able to protect us so our mail is not being monitored and there's equally, you know, 20 year sentences. Okay. Like it? Um, okay, we, we got a, la uh, a last um, bullet point here that people kept asking about, and one of them uh, seems to be a nurse. Um, so you can probably guess where this question is going. Lowering the cost of healthcare in America right now. Um, I know you've worked in the sciences, you've sort of skirted around healthcare. Um, how, can, how is that achievable? What would you do? How would you participate? What would you suggest? Well, one of the things, Lucian, is I, I, I'm not sure I, I've told you, the, the recent company that I started came out of my PhD work at MIT is to lower the cost of healthcare through massively increasing the drug development cycle. And that's called Cytosol. It's a technology I created where we can model the human cell on the computer. So instead of doing animal testing, test tube testing, and going down this 15-year process to create a drug, we're able to do it much faster and cheaper. In fact, in 11 months, we discovered a combination drug for pancreatic cancer and got allowance by the FDA. So it's, a re it's, more, it's going to be, in all humility, more revolutionary than email. That's cytosol. So I know a lot about healthcare because it's a field I've been interested in since I was six. Mm. My grandmother was a traditional uh, healer in Indian medicine. Uh, I spent my Fulbright for the last 10 years creating a, uh, a new educational uh, program called Systems Health that people have that we give it away for free where we're re-educating nurses, doctors, on how to integrate Eastern and Western medicine. Now, let me tell you, when it comes to health care, we got to all get out of the bamboozling of Obama health care, which is Romney care, by the way. Mm -hmm. It's not health care. That's health insurance. When we say health care, there's a few ways that what I would do immediately. Number one, eliminate the need to go to four-year college before you have to get your medical degree. Many other great countries do this. We need to create a lot more doctors. Number two, what we need to do is uh, go back to the concept that we had in the 70s. You know, I went to my doctor, I paid. You know, except for really destitute people, everyone should pay something. Because right now we have the copay, and we have to pay all this insurance, okay? So we gotta go back to this model where people know what they're buying and paying for, and it's fundamental. The third thing we have to do is, the entire pharmaceutical and what I call drugs and knives medicine, which is what we call healthcare, is comes from wartime medicine, which is about putting a soldier back on the field. 
That's what it was really about. It's not about prevention. We need to go back down in grade school. We need to teach people how to eat right. We need to teach people that we cannot be destroying our soil. You know, a, mm -hmm. a paper just came out saying ultra low levels of glyphosate, which is Roundup, which is what Monsanto has destroyed the soil, causes fatty liver disease, e.g. diabetes, obesity, okay? So we need to go back to clean soil, clean food. We need to educate doctors, barely take a nutrition course. So how are we supposed to uh, be healthy if most people don't even know how to eat and people, th and people don't know how to demand local foods? In Massachusetts here, what the western part of the state has amazing apples, yet we're shipping and stuff from all the way from Seattle. So you, okay, so you're you're essentially almost saying that that uh, a better jump start on education would lead in general to oh, yeah. to cheaper healthcare, yeah. right? You hit on the head. Education, you know, um, you know, in India there were two very interesting goddesses. Okay, the goddess Saraswati and the goddess Lakshmi. The goddess Lakshmi is a goddess of wealth. The mm -hmm. goddess Saraswati is a goddess of education and knowledge. And it turn and the story goes that if you want wealth. Go, you know, praise the goddess Saraswati, the goddess of education, mm -hmm. because the goddess Lakshmi is very jealous and she'll come to you. So we need to go back to the foundations of education, education, education. And I don't mean edu education, yeah, it's great to learn Shakespeare, I love it, I love art, but we gotta start teaching people basic skills. We gotta produce more nurses, we gotta produce more med techs, x ray technicians, and that has to start by unleashing Botech schools. And that's how we're going to lower the cost of medicine. There should be a hundred local doctors, you know, as I walk down the street. There's a hundred local yoga studios now, which is great, by the way. But we need to have back to the local community doctor, back to the village doctor, where the doctor would look at you, look at your eyes, look at your skin, not just typing away on a computer. The corporatization of medicine, Romney Care, Obamacare, has destroyed mm. health in this country. That's what's happened. It's, it, you know, I was talking to a anesthesiologist who says, Shiva, I got to give people three shots of painkillers because some nerd in some actuarial said, I have to do that, then I'm reducing the probability of some failure. So medicine is being driven top down, centralization again, not decentralization, and this is not going to get America healthy. So we need that whole program to be like, make, a, make America healthy again. Okay, so here's, here's, um, one last problem that I could just bring up with, with that, so on, on one hand, uh, you're saying that government intervention is the problem that has led to these issues, the regulations have uh, led to these issues, the lack of uh, proper education, the, the sort of kerfuffle in healthcare, but on the other hand, we need more regulation, we need more government intervention to save people from GMOs, to, um, to sort of, to give them this safeguard. Am I getting well, that wrong, actually, right? Well, yeah, actually, actually, it's a little bit different, right? Because the government, well, when you look at ph pharmaceuticals, right? Um, pharmaceuticals go through a safety process, right? Before you can ingest a chemotherapy drug. Um, and the reason we do that is because most of these are synthetics, right? So they have to mm -hmm. go through this because they never existed in nature. When we do genetic engineering, I'm saying you still need some safety paradigm. We don't have a safety paradigm. When x-rays came out, it took us, I think, 30 or 40 years to realize we needed shielding. I'm not opposed to genetic engineering. I'm just saying we don't have the safety processes in place. You know, it can be done through private or public, but the, my point as a scientist is that the safety assessment standards do not exist. That's all I'm saying. There's a safety issue here. So we, uh, you're saying the only role of government is to guarantee, okay, so what you're saying, right? The, only, the role of government for any of these industries is to guarantee uh, the safety as, of Americans, right? But not to interfere in the marketplace itself. Yeah, I mean, I think you go back to the core, which is safety of people in this country, you know, protecting our borders. I mean, in some ways it's a libertarian view. Mm. I'm not gonna be some purist libertarian, but I'm saying the goal of government was to put into place situations where it inspired the individual to be brave, to work hard, to take risks, not to sit at home, you know, uh, think By the way, this is, a, this is the most, Dinesh, do you know Dinesh uh, D'Souza? Dinesh D'Souza, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so this is, this is the most I've ever interacted with so many Indians at once. He just ha uh, <laughs> messaged me. Um, I, you know, I, I love it. Um, I, you know, um, if there's one thing people can say about me, I'm a, I'm a friend of the Indians. <laughs> uh, but, <laughs> the, the actual Indians. Well, listen, I, I, uh, I love what you're doing. I do wish um, 
that that we could get a little bit uh well it, i assume these the court documents one of the biggest things and i i will touch upon this once again briefly one of the biggest things that people are pushing back on with you uh is this mugshot um and they're they're saying people are are openly i don't know if they're plants but they're saying this disqualifies you this is out there sort of in the ether um if if people looked at those court documents, uh, it's it's an you're saying I and I don't want to fully close on this, but it, it's a non-issue. Uh, it was dropped, right? It was out. It was not just even dropped. It was beyond dropped. It was outright dismissed. Outright dismissed on the day of the trial. The judge took one look at it. He said, "Fuck this. It's a, it's done." He was outright dismissed by the court and the complaint. Okay. And it was not even sexual assault charges, it was potential. What's that, what's that mean? Can you even... Uh, uh, what that mean? It means like, you know, <laughs> you know, made up. Potential sexual assault charges. The bottom line is this. Are we Americans? Or are we living in the, you know some other society? This was outright dismissed. Mm -hmm. Outright dismissed by the Commonwealth and the complaint uh -huh. period. Now, we have to understand that, you know, when you have someone like me, who's, and I'm going to go harder, they're probably going to, you know, try to uh, say I beat my dog or something. I don't know, you know, uh, whatever it is. But the reality is people need to understand the context. We were up to 50 million impressions. We were exposing the swamp. And we weren't just exposing Elizabeth Warren, Lucian. We were exposing Charlie Baker, the rhinos, etc. We were defending the true meaning of what it means to be on the right. And I'm an outsider. I don't owe anything to any of these people, so they can bring it on. Would you, okay, it. so I, I will say, um, actually, you do have an entire, you have a website dedicated to disproving the stuff the left is saying about you didn't invent email. And then, okay, with the with the court documents, would you be willing to uh, to just put those out there? And everybody who who is bringing that up as uh, as a reason that they you're harder to elect when you show them what actually went on. No, and we, these people that you're talking to do not want to talk about, the people that you're talking about do not want to talk about, you have a guy who's running for U.S. Senate, they're deal guys, mm -hmm. who has a Photoshop picture of Donald Trump. We're the ones who hit this, okay? Look at this picture, three-handed Trump. We pay, you know, our campaign... As you, as you climb in popularity, though, they are going to hit those two issues. And I've seen them already do it. They've been doing it I for a while. It, but, but Lucian, here's this. Look, the reality is they can keep doing this all day long and it's going to fall flat on their face because this is a desperate attack by swamp creatures. You know? Mm -hmm. They can keep doing it all day long. The fact is, a 14 year old can invent an email. They can go talk to Dr. Les Michelson, who's still. Somebody, alive. by the way, in the chat, they're laughing about the image you just showed there. They're saying three handed Trump. <laughs> yeah, three handed Trump. <laughs> it's three handed Trump. I mean, think about it. This is a guy who's faked the photograph with the, the most powerful person <laughs> in the world. And you know, I, you know what? I think you know. I sent Warren a test kit. I'm gonna. I gotta send Deal a the Photoshop radius guy. <laughs> I got, hey, hey, Alan, let's do that tomorrow. Okay? Let's get that in Amazon. That's. I mean, look, you're talking. This is what I'm talking about. The skills problem. And you got a guy who doesn't even know how to use Photoshop properly. Has misused it. We hit him hard. We exposed the fact that he was not the, the Trump poacher. We started exposing all of it. And we're gonna do that. So if if people if if Americans put if uh, residents of Massachusetts put their faith in you to everybody uh, even the left they're sick of war if people if Americans put their faith in you okay as a counter to Elizabeth Warren um, you believe that that everything that's coming at you now and obviously the other uh, I mean I really think it'll just be the two things to be honest based on what I've seen um, you'll be able to handle that you'll be able to persevere. You are the best candidate. Yeah, I mean, look, honestly, you know, honestly, you're talking to a guy who, by all probability, shouldn't even be running for United States Senate, even in the United States, Lucian. You know, when I came here as an Indian, the Indians here were discriminatory towards me because they tried to figure out what caste I was from. So you're talking to a very different person. When I expose the corruption in the Indian government, I have to leave under death threats up through India. Now, people, if they want to go and see the website innovationdemandsfreedom.com, it's all laid out there. You know, people say, Shiva, don't go after Monsanto. They'll hire people to knock you off. All right? When we went after Gawker, oh, you're not going to beat, beat them. Well, not only do we beat them, they're bankrupt. Okay, mm -hmm. you're talking to someone who not only fights but wins. I'm a winner. 
And if people really want to beat Elizabeth Warren, I'm the guy who's going to do it. I'm the one who knows how to expose her for what she really is. I'm the one who's going to go after the swamp in Massachusetts, all of these guys. And people have had enough of this. And it's not, when you look at the Massachusetts landscape, there's one million independents. And they're pretty smart people. Half of the Democrats don't like Warren. And then you have the Republicans who probably, you know, 70, a number of them are the establishment Republicans. So I'm not counting on them, right? But what I do know is people in this country are very smart. They're not stupid. They watch, now they're watching shows like you, Gateway Pundit. They know CNN is fake news. They know when people put up a mugshot of someone, why they're doing that. You know, people are thinking now. People aren't stupid. They know a fake deal. They know a dirty deal. They know fake Trumpers. They know rhinos. These terms didn't exist before, right? Mm. People are understanding, and this is phenomenal. So we're in an important crossroads in American history. We can go into an age of, I believe, amazing enlightenment, or we can go into deep darkness. But the cesspool and the sewer that feeds that darkness is Massachusetts. Because Jonathan Gruber, the guy who's the architect of Obamacare, said everyone's stupid, educated at MIT. Elizabeth Warren and her husband at Harvard, okay? In this three mile radius is where we hatch all these creatures. And I'm out of them, but I know them, you know? I'm an insider who they wish they'd never given all those degrees to, because I'm committed to exposing them. And that's why I went through their educational process. So they have a serious problem with me, because I'm not gonna be a good Indian, I'm not gonna be an Uncle Tom, and I'm not gonna be their, you know, house slave. I can use a different word, right? So they have a problem with me. The left has a problem with me because I can attack Warren from the left, and the establishment rhinos and Dems have a problem with me because I'm not, I don't need them. The biggest thing now uh, is will we get on the ballot, okay? Just to give you a data point, last year when a guy called Mark Fisher ran, mm -hmm. great, very nice guy, good conservative, he had 600 delegates going in to the state convention 2014 against Baker. They screwed him, man. They gave him 14.9% when he needed 15%. He took them to court, and he won. They had to put him on the ballot, but he lost momentum. From what I understand, ballots were being shredded in the back. People were rewriting ballots. This is in our own Republican Party, Lucian. So in the old days, you know, Americans would send the white guys to other darkies to make sure they were doing election properly, right? Well, yeah. maybe we need to have international people send here. I don't know, but I'm telling you, 2014, a good conservative was destroyed by a clan here, and everyone knows about it, but no one talks about it. Shiva Iadure is talking about it, and that's why they had to release this nonsense of a case that was outright dismissed. And I'm going to keep dropping truth bombs because I believe truth is a weapon. And that's the only thing we have, and that's what the founders of this country were, and that's what it means to be an American. And so get ready, because Shiva's here, and he's going to beat Elizabeth Warren, and he's going to defeat her, but more importantly, he's going to expose the swamp. For what it is, I love we it. deserve that. Here's 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 a bookend uh, bookend question, and I think it's a very fitting one to to cap us out here. Um, people are asking, even if they don't live in Massachusetts, how can they support you? What can they do? What are you looking for? Well, here's the thing. Now, Elizabeth Warren has raised about ten million dollars. All right, the way people can uh, support us, give us lots of money. Keep yeah. using email. Every email you send. Back to him. Yeah. What's that? Every email? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, give us money. Give us your support. Let the world know that you know, the Shiva for Senate campaign is out here to clean the swamp in Massachusetts, which, remember, in Star Wars? Remember but is, is there a way of people who, who don't live in Massachusetts uh, of helping you out? I assume you have yeah, some. Yeah, they can go to Shiva for Senate, S H I V A number four Senate.com. You can donate there. If you want to help us uh, with any services or volunteers, you can help us at shivaforsenate.com. You know, we are running our campaign like an entrepreneurial business, meaning we're running it tight every penny we watch. You know, I've contributed a lot of my own resources to this campaign already. We have a bus that a bunch of MIT students built. We call it Real Indian One. We're taking that. Mm -hmm. um, we have everyone coming out to help us. We're not going, it's not a top-down campaign. This is a bottoms-up campaign. And I would say this is Trump version 2.0 in Massachusetts. That's what's going on. And it's and it's and, and the swamp creatures are afraid, they're desperate, and that's what we saw took place a couple weeks ago. 
Uh, I mean, w one of the things that I saw, which is remarkable and caught my eye, is you do have the same sort of grassroots momentum that Trump had, and that a lot of this this sort of new conservative uh, insurgents in America has. You're not backed by these career politicians or or the system itself. You are running based on ideas and and uh, how you can actually contribute, rather than this this sense of entitlement that you need that you deserve this role, like like Clinton, like Warren has continuously done. I mean, I, th I personally, uh, I think that's very impressive. And I, I, well, I, I it's interesting you say that, Lucian. We go to these, you know, in Massachusetts, just to give you a, a simple way, you have to get on the ballot. Not only do you need 10,000 signatures, you also need 15% of the delegates. Roughly about 2,000 of the 6,000 delegates come to the convention. 2,000 of the 6,000 delegates are super delegates. We criticize the Democrats. There's a racket here to keep outsiders out. So meanwhile, we tell people out to vote and get registered to vote. What people don't understand is the rigged system occurs way before the vote. And that's what we're on the ground fighting. So we need people to support us. We need exposure, exposure, exposure. And that's what really bothered these guys, you know? We didn't rely on any of these local mainstream media. We went out direct. I mean, we generated this press by ourselves. Mm. And the exposure helps us because it sends, and that's what the results were, you know, 50 million hits by ourselves. We didn't pay off anyone. We didn't have, you know, the insiders. That's what Jeff Deal has. People are voting for him. He's a nice guy. Well, he's not that nice of a guy if he's got a Photoshop pictures with the President of the United States. But we're doing it on our own, and it's a good old American way. Hard work and actual values and actually what you stand for. And we're going to win because I believe in people. Which I believe in the people in this country. I believe in America. My parents did. You know, we're all Americans ultimately, and these swamp creatures are in the minority. And we need to get rid of them fast. And that's what I'm going to do here in Massachusetts. Great. Wonderful. Well, you know what? Thank you. Uh, thank you for joining us. Hopefully, we'll, we'll have you back if, we, uh, if there are any follow-ups that emerge. Yeah, I mean, I'd like to talk more policy. And the next thing is, you know, winning the future for you. You're talking to a guy who knows how to solve problems, cheaper for Senate, real jobs, real health, real education, clean air, clean food, clean government. And this can be done through technologies and science and engineering and innovation. It's not going to be done top down. Innovation, not regulation. I like it. I like it. You know, I, one of the things that, that also struck me is it, for you it seems like it's not a left or right sort of argument. It is you you perceived and you see Elizabeth Warren as a major problem uh, and somebody who's holding the American people in Massachusetts back. Um, oh, yeah, I mean, I mean, think about it. This, the, this, this state's bond rating just went down. Yeah. This state's entire success is not based on the whole state, but a small epicenter in the Cambridge, Massachusetts area. You know, it's a top-down model. It's frankly a, a fictitious uh, success to everyone really looking at it. The western part of 495, the state, one, one could call it a completely different state, and they haven't taken care of that. They think MIT, Harvard, that military industrial complex of the elites is the one that's going to drive the state. Well, that's not going to work that much longer. And we're already starting to see chinks in the armor. Okay. I, you know, I, uh, I, I have faith in you. I do. And I, I want to see what you, uh, what you produce in the coming, uh, coming months. Um, thank you for coming on. Thanks, Lucian. Again, if she ever said it, let's have a good fight, man. Let's bring it on. And that's what we need. We need uh, the, the next American Revolution, and it's happening right in front of us. And the Civil War is also taking place. But I believe in this in, in this country and the patriots uh, that are here. Thanks, Lucian, and thanks to your audience for taking time on this uh, evening. Thank you. Thank you.